Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where we're talking about TV shows that are supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about Season 1, Episode 9 of The Midnight Club. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. So, we finally find out who is the person that actually is going home, and it's Sandra. And I was like, oh my god, that's so poetic, because Sandra's the one who didn't believe in all of this. She was like the one that was like the most reluctant, and lo and behold, what ended up happening? Uh, she ended up being the one that ended up getting cu cured. Well, she says it's like, it's from like a, a, um, it was something that was already shipped out a week before like everything went down so it's like yeah like what they did had nothing to do with it as she kind of reveals later on but Alonka wants to bring everyone into the fold because she talks to Kevin and Kevin's been seeing the old woman and the um old man he's seen the old man more often but he has seen the old woman from time to time Alonka's seen mainly the old woman but she's seen the old man from time to time and now it's like he also admits he's been seeing some crazy stuff too. In fact, he's actually been waking up down there in that basement area, um, even to the point that he even found himself waking up in the bed that's there. And it's like it's only ever happened subsequently since they discovered that place. Well, uh, that was what episode three or four when they ended up discovering that place. I mean, and it, obviously in the grand scheme, in the in the time frame of the show, it's been probably like a couple weeks at this point in time. So he's been going through that the entire time, and he didn't want to say anything to Alonka because he was thinking like, right, it had to be our meds or something. But she was like, no, like there's no way because she's like, at least tell me you've seen what I've seen because she's like that way I don't feel like I'm so alone and crazy. And, and Kevin admits he's seen it, so she wants to bring everyone in, wants to tell everyone, like, hey, there's one of us, it's cured, so it is working, so we need to try it again. But Sandra's like, no, it was me, I'm the one that's going home, because Alonka was so certain that it was her, because, like, like uh, Shasta really, like, pushed that narrative forward, and Alonka kind of started believing it, too. And I, I brought that up previously, I was like... The sub, like, you would assume that it would be Alonka, just because it's like, right, she's kind of got the main character status, all this weird stuff is kind of allocated around her, so you'd assume, like, once again, the, I would like to, to divert, um, to divert, uh, the, uh, god, what's the word I'm looking for, I said it last episode, um, basically to flip your expectations, um, of course, it wouldn't be Alonka, you know? But it never crossed my mind to think it would be Sandra and how... And, and like I said, at the last episode, I didn't even think about how poetically ironic it would be because it would be Sandra. But also, it almost feels befitting, too. There's there's layers to it because it's like, right, she's the one that's always kept her faith. She's always believed and she's the one that's kind of okay. Basically, at the end of the day, uh, she was misdiagnosed. And because of the chemo in her body, they couldn't tell that she was actually getting better or something like that, right? So there's still something there, but it's not... The, she's like, but what, I'm not dying with Stanton's like, we're all dying. Like, all of us are dying at all, every point in time. Like, the older, like, every day that's passing, every human being is dying. Obviously, sadly, just because of diseases, people are dying faster. So that's kind of like the perspective. Uh, we're all kind of in a st uh, stasis of dying. We're just all at varying different uh, rates of dying, essentially, is kind of how, like, Stanton was putting it. But that was kind of a shock for everyone being like, no, 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 wait. Oh, oh, because like now it's like they threw out my favorite phrase, which has been getting a lot of play lately, not just for me, but just like in the general things they use fully a do. And I'm like, what is up with that phrase getting so much play recently? If you're unaware, they even they explain it in the episode like Amesh is like, oh, he knows it because it's the title of one of his favorite uh, X-File episodes. Um, but essentially, uh, the new Joker movie, the, the sequel to uh, Todd Phillips Joker with uh, Joaquin Phoenix it's subtitled, it's Joker, subtitled, fully a do. So it's like, and there was something else recently, I can't remember off the top of my head what it was, but there was something super recently that I remember watching that reference fully a do, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, because it was, because at that time it was just after, like, it was like fairly recent, it was fairly like a little bit after, like, the Joker so, uh, sequel title came out, subtitle came out, so I was like, that was just interesting timing, so it's just like, I just feel like Fully Ado has been getting a lot of play recently, and I find that so interesting, because like, the first time I hear that phrase, I'm now hearing three different other properties reference that phrase, because I actually don't, I don't know if this is something straight out of this book, that, because this is based on a book, I don't know if it's like a series of books, or it's just one book, but, um, it might be a series of books, but um, I don't know if like fully ado was actually used specifically in the book too, because like I don't know how old this this book and or book series is. I have to look into that. Well, I'll, I'll look into it now. 
So quick Googling, it seems like it's one book. Also, it was published in the 90s, which also makes sense considering like why it had, like why it's specifically set in the 90s. I didn't know if that was just like an aesthetic choice, but it's like, no, the writer was writing based on what was like, you know, the time period they were in at the time. So it was like, yeah, the uh, was it Christopher Pike uh, was writing based on like the 90s because it was like the book was published in 94. So I was like, oh, that kind of makes a lot of sense. So either way. Uh, putting all that aside, so it, uh, I don't know if that's something specifically used in a book. It's kind of my reference because, like, uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's a phrase, it's a French phrase, so like, God knows like how long the French phrase is around. So there's going to be plenty of people use it. Like I said, it's just the timing of 2022 happening to be the thing where I've seen that phrase used like three times, fairly close to each other. I just thought it was interesting. Either way, um, because there's also the situation of Spence is the one that was kind of like, well, because I even love uh, Cherie being like, yo, if this was actually a real thing, I, you know, if I had experienced any of this stuff, I would say so just because, you know, even I won't even lie about it because it, it wouldn't be a funny situation to because even Spence is like, it doesn't uh, make any sense because like, right, most of the people that die in this place are kids slash teenagers so there's no one that's lived old enough to, so why would you be seeing an old man and a woman and the whole fully ado thing is like right kevin and alanka have been mainly talking to each other about this she's shared it with the other sure but she's really talked to kevin about it and now it's like maybe you're both sharing this delusion and so now it gets to that case of like well you know, now it's like, yeah, but what about Spence's circumstances? Like, what he heard over the speakers, like, oh, turns out that was Sandra. I was like, what? I was like, that's a twist I didn't see coming. It's like, yeah, Sandra, well, he was at a point where, like, Sandra was like, yeah, he felt so hopeless at the time, so she wanted to kind of nudge him in the right direction, like, you know, towards God. Because that was something she had talked about previously with Natsuki, about how, like, it's so exhausting that she's the only one of her faith here. Like really like she couldn't get anyone to join her side. And now it's like, she's the only one kind of pre and it get, gets exhausting when you're like, she kind of feels so isolated from the others. Cause it feels like her religion and her, her faith kind of separates her so much from the others. So I just thought that was such a fascinating thing. Um, and so she felt so bad about it. Cause she's, she feels this complex emotion of like, I'm happy I get to leave, but I'm also sad because I don't want to leave because you guys are my friends, but I also want to go. And so she's got all these jumbled emotions about it. And it cuts Ilanka deep because the, for one, Ilanka believed like, no, no, it was me. Okay. Well, we put that aside. I believe this can work. Wait, it doesn't work. A lot of this other stuff, like, was it just stuff between me and Kevin? Was I just seeing stuff? Was that not real? Did I kind of, like, you know, end up kind of sharing this delusion with Kevin? You know, so that's when you kind of get into that territory of Alanka kind of be like, almost like everything she believes is BS now. And she left, and she happened to run into Catherine, and God forbid she tore into Catherine, which I think was completely unnecessary. But obviously, like, Alanka was like, just everything happened at once. She's not the one that's going home. She, she was so certain it was her. She kind of didn't want to make, she didn't want to believe, but like I said, with Shasta, it made her kind of feel like, no, 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 I really am the one. I really, I, I, I should believe. And then you take the aspect of now, like, even like all that, because let's not forget this whole thing, Julia Jane was the main reason she came here. Her whole reason for coming here in the first place is because she held out hope that this place could be the reason that saved her, especially because the woman who had the exact same condition as her ended up like being saved. So that's where we kind of get into that complicated territory for uh, Ilanka. So, and I think just all those emotions, that anger, that sadness, and she kind of took it out on Catherine because it's like, oh, you you have the audacity to show up here with like your prom photos of Kevin and saying like, oh, I know he didn't want to do it, but I mean, he looks great. And it's like, yeah, like he had to put on 20 pounds of makeup to look happy for you. You don't even know what he's going through. Like, this isn't some like beach retreat or whatever. We're all sick here. We're all dying. And the fact is you want him to like walk down a beach with you because it's also like, well, she's also taking this out on her because it's like, well, she likes Kevin. And there's already been something there, but they never acted upon it for Kevin. It's like, right, he doesn't want to like do that to Catherine because it's like, that's his girlfriend. But she's ripping into her saying like, like kind of almost basically calling her selfish because I think it's like, she didn't realize how bad things were because, you know, the fact is that he never talked to her about it. But I think it's it's kind of like Alanka kind of taking on the Anya point of view where like Anya will like ripped into people like that in, in particular into Alanka in the beginning because it's like you're kind of being insensitive and, you, you know, like, right, we kind of have our thing here. And it's just and that's the sad thing. It's just like, you know, Kevin didn't want to tell um, Catherine and everything because it's like, right, you already worried and he didn't want you to worry even more. For one, he didn't want you to continue, to, like, he didn't want you looking at him and pitying him like other people would. Like, that would have just added more to the weight that he's carrying. And, you know, so it, it is that complicated thing of 
people need to be more aware of it, but at the same time, it's like she didn't have to go as hard in the paint against Catherine as she did. I mean, to the point, like, Catherine's, like, in tears by it when it's all said and done. Kevin's like, what the fuck, Alonka? Like, why'd you do that? And she recognizes how she messed up, and she was going to stay with Shasta because she's like, I can't go back there. Everything I thought was a lie. It's BS. I did what I did. Like, she probably figures, like, Kevin's going to hate her. The others are going to hate her, so... She was going to stay there, which Kevin and Spitz had in a conversation because he's like, you know what you want to do. And he's like, I'm not going to break up with Catherine. He's like, I didn't even say you had to do that. But the fact is, I told you to do what you want to. And that's immediately where your mind meant it goes. It's like that proves it. But for him, it's like, I don't want to break Catherine's heart because like, right, I'm already dying. He's like, that's the point. Like you she is a girl with a dying boyfriend and eventually she will be a girl with no boyfriend like you're not doing her any favors like the fact is when you die like you're going to leave a hole in her heart you're going to tear her apart by doing that so i don't know what you're thinking you're like saving her but but for him he he's like and he says his beautiful line that i thought was so interesting where he was like uh kevin said when it's all said and done, when you, he's like, do you know why I don't ever finish my stories? Because the moment you know the ending, the rest of the story disappears because it become, it all becomes about the ending. That's all you kind of focus on and you might lose some of the nuance and other elements of the previous parts of the story. And so when you get to that, um, for him, it's like, I want, because all they're going to remember is the end. I want them to all have good memories of him. So I think that's why, like, he pushes back a little bit against his mom and stuff like that. And he also probably, like, does that, like, despite his family's issues, it's like, he tries to, once again, be the perfect son, be the perfect brother, be the perfect boyfriend. Because when he ultimately dies, because he knows he will, he wants them all to have a good memory of him. Especially with Catherine, he's like, yeah, she's earned it. Like, she's been nothing but a good person and a good girlfriend, supportive. So I don't want to, like, break her heart and hurt her anyway despite the way i i clearly feel about alanka you know so i think that's such an an interesting element so Ilanka is with uh shasta and shasta's going on and on again about like right you think it didn't work or maybe maybe it did maybe it didn't but there is something special about the place and the moment she's going on and on she's like and the moment she says because it i know and i'm like oh you're Julia Jane, and that also explains why you got beef with um with Stanton because Stanton bought that place like three years before Julia got there, and so it's like right, you know how stubborn because she because the way she interacted with Alanka about it's like oh yeah, I'm super on your side about Stanton. Stanton so um kind of rigid and kind of stuck in her own ways, and now it kind of makes sense because they probably. And because even because I kept making parallels of like Alanka's a lot like Julia. I mean, not only did they share the same uh, condition, but also like they kind of have a very similar outlook and dynamic with uh, Staten. And it kind of made it seem like, oh, um, Shasta was kind of in that same vein. But it's like, well, now it makes sense. Why? Because, you know, her and Alanka are a lot closer than you think. And she's like, right, I did walk away cured. So yeah, that place is on those ley lines and everything. So we're going to go in there and I'm going to cure you and, you know, cure all your friends essentially. So when midnight club is over, like, you know, you're going to let me in, we're going to go to the basement. And that's when I was like, mm -hmm. this is when your sinister side Kate is starting to come out. Cause I was like, what? Cause I brought it up last episode when she was just not be like, Oh, if you want to, I'm not saying you should or have to, like she was beating around the bush, but it was just like, okay, now you're showing your true colors. Like everything has been about warming up to Alanka being like her only friend and ally, because I think it speaks volumes that out of anyone, she's only interacted with Alanka. I mean, to be fair, Alanka is like the only one who really goes out in the woods. Like Amesh was saying like, Oh, I'm gonna go out there. But like no one actually did. She's the only one that Shasta has interacted with over the course of the entire show. So that's almost like, it's always been like a, what is Shasta's whole deal? Like, yeah, she's living out in the woods, but why is it that like no one else at Brightcliff has had this interaction except for Alanka? That's on purpose. Cause she knew that Alanka, she saw like, you're a lot like me. We could, you, I could take advantage of it. Like that's what this episode definitely felt like. A, oh, I'm going to take advantage of you. I'm like, oh, I'd be I, like, I was always a little suspicious of her, but like last episode really solidified it for me when she was just kind of beating around the bush being like, I mean, I think, oh, if you could get that book back for me, I, I mean, you don't have to, if you feel like she was, she was hamming it up too much. So I was like, okay, I see how it is. I see what time it is. So either way, um, at the same time, well, circling back a little bit, um, Mark ended up taking Spitz to meet some of his friends. They're, they're an activism group representing like, you know, I think it's because like the, the gay community is viewed a certain way because it's like, well, I think not just gay, the gay community, I think specifically, 
uh, gay men and women with AIDS, I think specifically. So I think it, it, it could be a combination of the two, but they are trying to like get rights because like people are, especially in this time, once again, the eighties and nineties fearing, uh, the gay community because, because of like AIDS. Once again, it's like, it's not, there was even that moment. I, I, I actually forgot to talk about it during that whole thing when like, uh, when they were trying to save Anya, he was like, okay, you know, you can't get it like this. She's like, I know, but even if it, even if it was, I, I don't care considering like you're my friend and I know you're doing everything you can to help me. So thought that was kind of beautiful. I, I actually kind of forgot about that little element to it until now. But being surrounded by other people, you know, because for, you know, he, he felt so alone. He didn't really have any like friends he could turn to in that sense. And I think that kind of beautifully kind of flows into his story later on that he tells. Uh, but he had that, I love that moment with Mark. He was like, yeah, how, how did you know? He's like, you know, how, how, how'd you get involved with that? He's like, being gay, I was born this way. He's like, oh, 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 you mean the, you mean the, uh, the, uh, oh God, I forgot the game they were playing. He's like, oh, it's just a really good part of game. It's like, no, the activism. He's like, because it turns out the person who got him involved in this has, was a, was a dear friend of his that sadly died. And he's like, honestly, there's so many seats at that table that have, um, of people they've lost. It's like, they've lost many, many people to this circumstance. But for him, it's, it is a situation of wanting to show no fear and in, in, under these circumstances, um, not letting, because that's what this is. He was like at, 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 at the bare minimum, uh, they're in different people like outside of it will like treat them in, like indifferently at worst they will respond with fear about like you know once again everything associated with them and it's like we are all are all gonna die but they obviously want to do what they can to help you know you know just kind of like passing the torch on like mark was kind of brought into the fold with this he's kind of doing that with spence and kind of making him once again see like you aren't alone we're kind of all in this there is a community out there fighting for all of this so i thought that was kind of nice and like i said that helped influence a lot of spence's story which i do love before it was all said and done everyone even alanka congratulates sandra it's like yeah it's kind of messed up you did the whole like messing with me over the intercom thing and Spence being like, I will come back to haunt you specifically. You know, don't thank God or Jesus for it. It's like, the fact is, if you do, I'm going to haunt you specifically and you're going to have it coming back for, at you uh, because, uh, you know, the whole, it was super messed up about the whole intercom thing. And she's like, right, uh, kind of not my proudest moment, but everyone's celebrating. It's like, right, you getting to go home. It's like, it's what any one of us would have wanted. It's like kind of what, you know, and if it, you know, if it was with the Anya circumstances, it was kind of the same thing too. So it's like, right, you getting to go home, don't, you know, you take advantage of that. Like you, you live for all of us. So, and even Alanka congratulates her and thanks her. So Spence is taking over this story. And I think it's really neat. Uh, cause we've only gotten, cause most of the stories this series have been supernatural stories. This is the second science fictional story because Amish's story was a, a sci-fi story about time travel. Well, this one actually kind of was about time travel, too. So I wasn't sure where this was going to go. And I love a mesh kept interrupting, being like, it's about death. It's about death. He's like, no, it's not about death. Just keep, keep the story, like, wait until the story kind of plays out. But initially, like, you know, there's obviously a lot of parallels. To, once again, that's what these stories are, that he ended up um, talking about himself. He's a new transfer student. And he was kind of obsessed with this dude, Christopher. And it's like, oh, okay, interesting. And he was trying to, like, get close to Christopher and so he's like, right, I got a really expensive VG, uh, I said VG, VCR recorder. I was trying to record the Terminator movie because like, hey, he's a science sci-fi geek like I am. So let's take advantage of it. I can invite him over, which that eventually did work. And I was like, yo, he brought the wine, cheese. They made like Terminator, like uh, cheese puns. Uh, but then it turns out they weren't watching the uh, the movie. It was a game that was recorded, which I love that Kevin constantly kept interrupting like, they wait, the what, what? He was like, oh, the, the C, some, some, he mentioned two teams and he's like, Kevin's like, you know, those aren't two real team names. He's like, I don't care. I don't like sports. He's like, so the 99ers and the Orca, um, the Oak, uh, uh, Orcas. And Kevin's like, those aren't better. I love that. He just kept interrupting that. He's just like, oh my God, what is with these names? I love it. It's so good. I love, I love that bit. Uh, and I even love in the story, the news reporters like, yeah, the, uh, the Niners and the um, Orcas, which those are real teams with real names. I love that was even included in the story. But it's like, OK, I guess something glitched. Like, why did it? What happened? They happened to go and uh, to a bar. It's like, wait, that game was already recorded last night. It's like, no, it's live. And they make a bet. And it turns out 
the VC, VC, I kept doing it again. The VCR tape ended up recording a future, so they took advantage of it and they act, they racked up a few um, wins because they ended up getting about twelve hundred bucks out of the whole deal. And also things changed as like things escalated between uh, Rel uh, Spence's character and Christopher. And I love that he says this line uh because like once again the mesh kept being like, oh it's about death. He's like, no. The one thing that you can be sure in life, the only uh kind of a, like consistency in it is change. That's the only thing that is a known factor in life that there will always be change, whether it's a little bit or a lot. And so but there was a change in the videotapes this time. Instead of a sports game, it ended up being like, oh my god, this student gets hit by and killed by a falling AC unit, which it's interesting that the person was uh, Sandra's character, which it's almost like, oh, like by the grace of God, she ended up, you know, it's like, oh, it's kind of a miracle she was saved. So it almost feels poetic in that regard. But then Christopher saw this weird guy and was like, this guy was giving me the weird vibes. And he's like, but now like they both start feeling weird about it. Cause like, right, this tape, like if it's not just showing us games anymore, like, but yeah, you saved someone's life. And it's like, yeah, but we don't know what this is. Like, what if I don't or I'm not able to save someone's life next time? Like, that's a lot of guilt knowing, like, the future and you're not able to help the person. So they promise not to watch the tapes. But and I love that line from Spence of, you know, the, the thing about when you're all by yourself for so long, it ends up you when you don't have someone around you, you kind of like another person kind of makes you kind of pretend like you're not who you are. So basically a lot of who he was kind of fell to the wayside because Christopher around, but now that you're back to being alone again, you're no longer have Christopher to pull you away from who you really are. So he ended up uh, watching the tape, finding out about Christopher and his mom rushes over. And, um, but it turns out like the moment I was like, wait, what's this all about? And then especially you tie that. Cause from the very beginning, I was like, wait, right? cause I thought, well, it ends up being, ends up being a case, but at moment, like they introduced the whole element at first when he's having the dreams about the cybernetics and stuff. I'm like, are you actually a robot? Did Christopher make you? Cause well, we know he was like working on a robot earlier on. I was like, that's kind of weird. Like, is it his own version of like, oh, you were someone important to him that he like made you in the image of and he wanted that person. Like what, what's going on on that front? And then especially when the like the someone comes knocking at the door, like especially when the 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 thing that knocked Christopher and his mom out, I was like, oh, that's a I was like, that's something futuristic. I was like, wait, what are we doing? And then the guy comes when the clothes. It's not until um like he had t like not until part way into the conversation, I'm like, wait, are we doing a Terminator thing here? And it's like we kind of are. Rail is actually a robot, but he was sent, he went back in time, but he's defective because the person before him, the the guy in the Coat is Christopher from the future. Basically, little by little, he replaced a lot of his parts until he became something more than human. So, what this is all about is that Rel escaped and he was trying to find Rel. Rel made the mistake of getting photographed when he saved that student, and that's how uh, Christopher found him. So, it's like, right, this whole thing is about you're defective. You are a cyborg that's infected with fear and fear leads to suffering and for him it's like i've perfected the human race so that we're no longer bogged down by that i'm saving people i saved the human race from fear and suffering but you you are you came back in time to try and kill a younger me to stop me from saving the human race and so but the, the long run of it all it's like right this thing inside of you is a disease that um this disease that is fear. So obviously the disease in him is like a metaphor for, for, I mean, obviously for both the fear that people have for the disease that is in him, that is AIDS, but also the fear of like, you know, that, you know, like, no, like that whole thing of like, you have to be perfect, you know? And for, it was, it's a situation of, it's like, right, you do what you got to do because I do love you. He's like, I'm not the one that's malfunction. I'm not the one that's uh, screwed up. You are. The fact is that you want to take away fear from people like fear isn't a, you know, isn't a bad thing. It's like, you know, it, every aspect of it, like humans, and you know, it's a phrase that I've kind of like taken, you know, it, it's not should be used all across the board. But it's like, I think in gen, gen, generally speaking, and I don't like I said, it doesn't always apply to everyone. But I do believe generally speaking, I think people are perfectly imperfect. You know, we are capable of making mistakes. We are capable of not being perfect. We are perfect. We are perfect because we're imperfect. That imperfection, I think, allows us to grow, to change, to be better, to do better, you know. 
And you lose a lot of that when you remove like one facet of that humanity and that is fear. Like you chip away any part of that humanity, chipping away at the fear at least because it's like i think it might be that thing of thinking like right with fear comes suffering but without suffering there is no change there is no growth he kind of he basically chipped away at his humanity and basically he got stuck in what he is and he can never grow beyond that you never give people the chance to grow or learn you know so uh rail leaves a message in the tape as uh future christopher kills him and that message showing Christopher everything he can do and all he does, the good and the terrifying, what he does to humanity. And for Rel, it's like, right, he was um, malfunctioned. But for him, it's like, I loved, you know, and that, would, and that was an important thing that this something that, you know, Christopher had messed up, you know, changed humanity. And this Christopher rem focused on that love and he never went down that route. Um, to ever change humanity, you know, he does good, but never like he never that future has changed. And I thought that was beautiful, you know. And once again, it being like the metaphor for um, Spence, because he knows like, when, you know, and we find out because Kevin's like, you told me about the person who he was like, y your friend, he was like, yeah, Christopher. He's like, yeah, he's the one that infected me. I, I don't know where he is, but I hope he's loved. You know, he's like, just like I am. Um, he's like, I, I wish I knew then what I knew now, kind of more so of like we were so afraid and una, un, uh, unable to kind of accept ourselves for who we are. But now he is. He fully embraces himself because of everyone around him loving him for him being him. So I did think that was uh, beautiful. So kind of neat, ultimately, how that all ties together. Um, but then you have Alanka sneaking um, Shasta in, or Julia, and in that moment, the moment Julia comes in with the robes, she's got the other people, I'm like, looking a little culty to me, because she was making a whole point, once again, that they're not the Paragon, it was like, they made some mistakes, they were misguided, or whatever, I'm like, I'm not liking this one bit, and it's the moment they get down there, they start doing their thing, I'm like, whoa, 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 I was like, wait a minute, 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 I was like, are we going to find out that Shasta slash Julia is actually a say-so? Because I kept being like, okay, I think, because um, I, I still, I'm still on it. I still am holding on to the belief that um, Stanton is actually Athena. But I think that would also play into it. Like, I think, I'm, I'm believing, especially with the way the ritual plays out, I think Shasta slash Julia, like I said, is a say-so. And basically, she, um, Benjamin buttoned herself, and she came back to uh, Brightcliff. And I think, basically, she ended up, like, that's what this is all about. She sacrifices other people. Like she even talked about like, oh, healing and restoring like youth or whatever. I'm butchering it, but it, she said something along those lines. I'm like, wait, are you making yourself internally young by sacrificing other people? Because something I read really quickly too, I didn't know. I, I'm going to talk. I'm curious to see like, based on what I read, a little description about the book, the book, there's only five characters. So I wonder, did they make uh, two more characters specifically for the show? Potentially. I don't know. They might have made they might have made they might have made characters specifically kind of like adapting the show more so for like present day while even setting it in the 90s kind of fitting like conversations that would be in the in the 90s that are still very true and potent today. Like there's there's some ideas I have about like certain characters. I'm like, I, I could see that probably being a character made specifically for the show now that might not. So I just, but I thought it was interesting. I was like, oh, I, I, cause I noticed that detail. Of like, oh, there's only five people in the book, especially cause like the whole thing about like the sacrifice, like the whole, like, oh, you only need five sisters anyway. So I'm like, I don't know. Well, 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 I'll look into that more um, when I'm, when I'm done, but like that ritual just started seeming like weirder and weirder and her being at the centerfold of it and the blood ending up on her. And Alanka was thinking like, oh, I thought I'd be in the center because it's about curing me. But you're in the center. It's like, no, it's about curing her. And the moment it's like all oh, these cups and stuff, I'm like, she's about to sacrifice you. It's like the Aceso thing. Aceso was the only one left in because she had like the blood prints on her face and stuff like that. Because once again, her and Athena, we still don't know what their circumstances are. I still say I think Staten is uh, Athena. I think that's why she got even more upset. That's why the Paragon, because her mother did all this so like of course like she would be upset by it so she immediately reckon i don't know if she doesn't know that because i don't know if she knows that julia is her mom maybe she thinks like oh you're Ju like maybe julia's attempt to do it like she got cured but it maybe it led to the other children dying and just like obviously um 
Stanton had no, like, but maybe Stanton didn't realize that I was actually her mom. Like, I don't know, or maybe she does know. Because she called her Julia. She didn't go by, like, oh, like, her mom or something. Not unless we find out Julia is actually her mom's name, because we don't, once again, we don't know Athena or Julia's real, uh, or, or, uh, Aceso's real name. That was just the names they went by. So, because the whole thing was like, right, they disappeared, but they most likely changed their names after the fact, so. Um... But yeah, like the moment it's like, oh, drink from the cup. I was like, don't drink it, Alaka. Do not, do not, do not. But even she was like, something's not right. She's like, what is in this? And luckily Stanton showed up when she did because like, uh, Bashasa was like, drink it, go ahead and drink it. But the others started dying and she comes to attack um, and Laka and Laka kind of bumps her head against the wall and kind of passes out. So this is where it's left us. The next episode is the season finale. Um, I'm really interested to see how this plays out because it might just be like a series finale because I don't know if this... Why does it say limited series? So, because I was curious whether or not this is the entire book or not. Because it might not be the entire book. Um, maybe like say for example, it might be covering like a third of the book, or maybe it's an I, I don't know. I'll have to wait till see how the finale plays out, and then kind of look into it a little bit to find out whether or not like that's covering the entire book. I feel like this is probably most likely only covering some of the book story, but either way, uh, an interesting place to leave us off at an interesting setup for the, the, the season finale to see where, how this all plays out. Cause the, uh, t episode title is midnight. So that's definitely going to be interesting. Um, and I'm excited to see how this all wraps up, where this all ends up taking us, whether my theory in this episode and some of my long running theories end up being true. We'll ultimately have to wait and see, but, uh, really that's all I want to talk about to the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, Live life to the fullest and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.